I'm Pastor John Baird, and I want to welcome you to The Way the Word Ministries television ministry. I'm so happy and honored to be here sharing God's Word with each and every one of you, as always. And we are still in our study of the book of John. This is message number 65 in our study, and today we're going to be in part two of a message that I started the last time we were together called The Real Lord's Prayer. And today we're going to be in John chapter 17, verses 20 through 26. Now, most of you watching and listening today live right here, just like I do, in what's known as the United States of America. But the truth is, we become the divided states of America. I'm bringing you this message today in the late summer of 2024, and there is division everywhere you look in our nation. And even though the current presidential administration claims that they have united the nation, the truth is the division is worse than ever. There's racial division, there's political division, there's even division within the divisions, and it's all fueled by career politicians as well as a corrupt media that's following a hate-filled political agenda that's bent on globalism. Everywhere you look across our land, there's division in families and in homes. And back in 1858, Abraham Lincoln, you all remember Abraham Lincoln anyway, he was running for the Senate and he was running against an incumbent by the name of Stephen Douglas. And those two guys had seven debates. And in one of those debates, Abraham Lincoln, he quoted the words of Jesus from the book of Mark, chapter 3, verse 25, where Jesus said, If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Now, Abraham Lincoln, he lost that Senate race to Stephen Douglas, but it didn't get Abraham Lincoln down. Instead, he spent the next 24 months zigzagging across this country talking to the public. And he became famous because of his brilliant speeches. And two years after after losing that Senate race, he became president of the United States. And he, Abraham Lincoln, he absolutely presided over a divided nation. You may remember that little thing called the Civil War. The nation was divided before the Civil War, during the Civil War, and after the Civil War, so much so that in 1865, an assassin assassinated Abraham Lincoln, shot him and killed him. And we are living in that same kind of a divided nation today. Again, so much so that just about two and a half months before me bringing you this message on July the 13th, there was a calculated assassination attempt against former President Donald Trump. He was shot and wounded by an assassin, and it was absolutely an attempt by his political rivals to silence him and stop his bid for re-election as president of the United States. Again, we are absolutely living in a divided nation today. Listen, the devil may not be smart in every field of mathematics, but he excels at long division. Satan, he's the great divider, but God, he wants his people to be united, so much so that we find Jesus here praying this prayer in John chapter 17, on the night before the crucifixion, and he is praying that all of his followers are going to be united. And we looked at the first part of this prayer the last time we were together, and we're going to look at the rest of it today. And as I said the last time that we were together, this is the longest and, in my opinion, the most beautiful prayer ever recorded from the lips of Jesus. But it's not just 
a prayer. As we hear the words of Jesus as he prays to God the Father, what we find is that there is powerful theology in this prayer. Consider these two statements with me. Number one, in this prayer, Jesus taught the definition of eternal life. In verse 3 of John 17, he said, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And number two, in this prayer, Jesus reveals the source of truth. In verse 17 of our verses, he prayed, sanctify them by the truth, Father. Your word is truth. And in our culture today, a culture where most people say that truth is relative, well, Jesus is telling us right there that God's word is is the only truth. It's absolute truth. The book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is our high priest. Look in the book of Hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 through 16. It says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And I don't know how you might view this prayer of Jesus, but since Jesus is our high priest, I personally view it as more than just the real Lord's prayer. I view it as the high priestly prayer of Jesus. And so as we approach it in our verses, we should really remove our shoes because we're absolutely standing on holy ground. I got my shoes off right now. I came to the studio with them on today. I got to be careful doing that. I'm not as young as I used to be anyway. The last time we looked at the first 20 verses of this prayer, and today we're going to finish looking at this prayer by looking at these last seven verses. So let's jump in the book of John, chapter 17, verses 20 through 26. Jesus prayed, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. And so before we start breaking this whole thing down by way of review, I want you to remember that this prayer can be broken down into three parts. First, in verses 1 through 5, Jesus prayed for himself to be glorified. Then in verses 6 through 19, Jesus prayed for his disciples to be fortified and sanctified. And in our verses for today, verses 20 through 26, Jesus prayed for all believers to be united. Now I talked a little bit in the last message about how we as Jesus's followers are in the world but we're not of the world. And in these last seven verses, Jesus, he prays specifically for all of us, his followers here in our day, in our season. You just heard him. He just prayed for everyone who would believe because of the testimony of those original disciples. Check it out with me again in verses 20 and 21 of our verses. Jesus prayed, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. And in this prayer, Jesus, he prayed three prayer requests for all of us. Isn't it exciting to know that through faith in Jesus, we can be the answer to Jesus's prayer. So let's examine these three prayer requests right now. Number one, Jesus prayed that we will keep the unity of the Spirit. In this prayer, Jesus prayed four times that all of his followers would be one, just as he and the Father are 
one in verses 22 and 23 of our verses Jesus prayed I have given them the glory that you gave me father that they may be one as we are one I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me and so if we're going to understand unity the first thing we have to do is understand what unity is and what unity is not. Letter A, unity is not uniformity. Some organizations need uniformity. That's why they have uniforms, right? The military, they're all about uniformity. Unfortunately, there are some churches out there that confuse uniformity with unity. They think everybody that comes inside their church should look and dress a certain way or worship a certain way or use whatever version of the Bible it is that they use. I even heard about a church down in Texas where they've got a barber shop inside so that if a man gets saved, they can give him what they call a Christian haircut. But the truth is, there's great diversity in true unity. I love the fact that there are so many different kinds of people in the body of Christ. We got long hairs, short hairs, even no hairs. We got people who dress in clothes from Neiman Marcus to people that walk around in blue jeans and gym shoes all the time. We've got white collars, blue collars, and no collars. We got all different kinds of skin tones and languages. And so the truth is, letter A, unity is not uniformity. And letter B, unity is not unification. Over the years, there's been all these human-made efforts to try to bring all the different religions in the world together. And interestingly enough, there's a religion that was started in the 19th century over in Iraq, and it kind of spread to a few other parts of the Middle East. And today, it's spread all the way around the world. It has about five to eight million followers, and it's called the Baha'i Faith. And it teaches that there are many paths to God, which, of course, tells you right away that it's a false teaching. There's a Baha'i Temple in Chicago with nine doors in it. Eight of the doors represent the major religions of the world, and the ninth door is called a DIY door, which stands for do-it-yourself door. So if you want to, you can just go through that ninth door and start your own religion. I mean, why follow the one true God when you can just make up your own God, a God that goes along with your life, a God that goes along with what you want to do? Anyway, maybe some of you have seen those bumper stickers out there that say coexist. The characters in the symbol, they represent, and I say this tongue-in-cheek, they represent the religions, some of them are so-called religions of the world. The first one is the crescent moon of Islam. Then there's the peace symbol for pacifism. Next is the symbol for sexual rights. And that would include that whole alphabet crowd out there. And when I say alphabet crowd, I'm not using that term in a derogatory manner. I'm not going after people here that you might think I disagree with or who disagree with me. But when the alphabet crowd thing started, they only had three letters of the alphabet. And as time went on, people within the group, they began to add more letters to it. And the people who were in the original three letters of the alphabet crowd, they didn't like that because they said, hey, those other letters, they don't represent us the way that we want to be represented. And now after years of adding letters and taking letters away, they just put a plus sign at the end of the alphabet. And that just means whatever you want to be, you have sexual freedom to be whatever you want to be. And so what I'm trying to show you is that even the entities within the coexist symbol, they all have infighting among themselves. Even the coexist symbol itself, it's been changed numerous times. I'm just showing you the original one. And when I say there's infighting among all the entities on the coexist symbol, I'm talking about Christianity too, right? A lot of infighting between denominations and non-denominations, a lot of theological arguments to me most of them are 
non-eternal. But anyway, back to the symbol itself. Next, there's the Star of David for Judaism, and after that, the Wiccan or witchcraft symbol. That one's supposed to be a candle with a little pentagram in that circle for a flame. Then, there's the symbol for Taoism, known as the Chinese yin-yang. And finally, we see the cross representing Christianity. And what's really ironic is, if you study the history of the entities that are represented by the coexist symbol, the only one that doesn't pose a threat to any of the other ones is Christianity. And I'm talking about real Christianity. I'm not talking about religious Christian zealots like the guys who started the Crusades. Not only that, but over the years, people who have used the coexist symbol and even laid claim to it, well, they have a hard time getting along together too. It was created by a Polish artist for a contest in Jerusalem. And then about three years later, a bunch of students from the University of Indiana, they obtained an illegal copyright for the coexist symbol. The next thing you know, around 2005, Bono and those guys in U2, they were wearing coexist headbands and t-shirts and a bunch of fashion designers. They decided to go ahead and start producing it. And the next thing you know, there's all these copyright lawsuits being filed. And the poor Polish guy who created it, he wasn't getting a penny. Everybody else was making money. But finally, after years of contentious lawsuits and millions of dollars in legal fees, the Polish artist, he finally got the credit that he deserved. But the real problem with the whole coexist symbol is there can only be one truth. And while I absolutely believe we should show respect to people's different views, the idea of putting them in a bowl and mixing them all together, that's not unity again. That's unification. Listen, Jesus, he didn't say he's just one way to heaven. He didn't even say he's the best way to heaven. Jesus said he's the only way to heaven. Look at John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And remember, God's word, it's absolute truth. And so, letter B, unity, it is not unification. So what is unity? I'm glad you asked because that's going to take us to letter C. Unity is our shared connection in Jesus. Understand there are two expressions of the body of Christ. Number one, there's the church as in all believers in every nation. That's why Jesus just prayed for there to be unity among all Christians here on planet earth. And number two, there's the church as in the local church, the body of believers that you hang out with. And that doesn't have to be a big denomination or a single church entity. Again, it's whenever and wherever you gather with other believers. Now, we don't have a lot of control over unity on planet Earth as a whole, but all of us, we can all participate in the unity of our local church or our local gathering. And the first thing that we need to understand about Christian unity is that it's an act of the Holy Spirit. We can't create it. We can only keep it or kill it. And that's why the Apostle Paul told us this in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 verses 2 through 6. He said, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And so we're called to keep the unity that the Holy Spirit creates. Again, we can't create it. We can only keep it or corrupt it. Now, as many of you know, I used to be a missionary and I traveled all around the world. And no matter where I went, I always found an immediate bond when I met another believer. The truth is, I'm more comfortable around a Filipino Christian or a Russian Christian or an African Christian than I am with an American that doesn't know Jesus. I'm more comfortable with those guys than I am with my neighbor down the street who doesn't know Jesus. That's what's called the unity of the Spirit. And for the record, I am not a believer in life on other planets. But if there is life on other planets, then they had to be created 
created by the same God that created all of us. And so if there is a Klingon Christian flying around somewhere out there in outer space and I meet up with him, I'm going to get along a whole lot better with that Klingon Christian than I am with an earthling right here that doesn't know Jesus. That's what the unity of the Spirit is all about. Look what Jesus said in John chapter 13 verses 34 and 35. He said, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. When people within the body of Christ can't reason with one another, it destroys the testimony of just who we are in Jesus. Down in Alabama on one side of a rural road, there's a church called New Harmony Church, and right across the street, there's another church, and it's called New Harmony Church 2. Sound confusing? Well, apparently there wasn't too much harmony in the original New Harmony Church. The church split, and one segment of the church, they moved right across the street, and they started New Harmony number 2. And as funny as that little story might seem, what does something like that really say to that lost and fallen world out there? Listen to me. It takes more than the name on a church to create harmony. It requires the work of God the Holy Spirit to create the kind of harmony that unites. And it takes all of us in the body of Christ to maintain it. That's why in verse 23 of our verses, as Jesus was praying to God the Father, he made a declaration to God the Father, and he said that when all of us demonstrate that kind of unity, the unity of the Spirit, well, that's when the world will know that you, God the Father, sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So the first prayer request that Jesus prayed for all of us is, number one, that we will keep the unity of the Spirit. And the second prayer request that Jesus prayed for all of us is, number two, Jesus prayed that we will be with him to see his glory. And so how do we know that Jesus wants all of us, his children, to be with him in heaven? Well, there are three reasons. First, letter A, because of the price Jesus paid. In the book of John, chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life in him. Letter A, Jesus paid the price. And letter B, we know Jesus Jesus wants all of us to be with him in heaven because of the promises Jesus made. Look at John chapter 14 verses 2 and 3 where Jesus said, My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. That's a promise from Jesus. And when it comes to keeping promises, Jesus is batting a thousand. And that's letter B, Jesus paid the price. And letter C, we know Jesus wants us to be with him in heaven because of this prayer that Jesus prayed, this prayer that we're looking at right here. Look at verse 24 from our verses. Jesus prayed, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Now, to me, these words that Jesus prayed, here in verse 24 of our verses, well, they are some of the most loving words that Jesus ever prayed. Understand, he knew that soon after praying this prayer, he was going to willingly die on a cross for all of us. He also knew that soon after his resurrection, he was going to ascend back to God the Father in heaven, leaving all of us, his disciples, back here in a world that absolutely hates us. And so Jesus, he prayed for all all of us, knowing that through faith in his great sacrifice of love, well, that anyone and everyone who believes and receives that would one day join him in heaven. Now, back in the 1800s, Charles Spurgeon was a preacher in London, and he preached during a time when preaching was all about eloquent oratory. Now, obviously, 
I don't have that gift, George Truly. I don't talk that way, but Charles Spurgeon did. And I love the way that he described verse 24 of Jesus's prayer of these verses that we're looking at today. He said, Jesus did not say he wished his people to be in heaven, but that he wanted them to be with him in heaven because that makes heaven heaven. There shall we have no fields to till, no garment to spin, no wearied limb, no dark dark distress, no burning thirst, no pangs of hunger, no weepings of bereavement. We shall have not to do or think upon, but forever to gaze upon that Son of Righteousness, to be satisfied forever with His favor and full with the goodness of the Lord. Oh, if we have only to die to get to such delights as these, then death is gain. It is swallowed up in victory. Like I said, we don't all have the same gifts, eloquent oratory, that is not my gift, at least not with this accent, but just like Charles Spurgeon there broke down verse 24 of Jesus' verses, I believe something the Apostle Paul said really nutshells what Charles Spurgeon said right there. In the book of Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, the Apostle Paul said, For to me, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. This world, it's a crazy place, and there are so many ways that people all people suffer. There are people out there right now and they are suffering emotionally, physically, spiritually, financially, relationally. This world, it is a place of suffering. And in the midst of all that suffering, well, there's all of us walking around in our God-given free will. And that's why Jesus prayed for us. He's praying that all of us are going to make the choice to be one with him in spirit right now and thereby spend eternity with him one day in heaven. And the Apostle Paul, he really summed this up quite well in the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 18, when he said, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And so the second prayer request that Jesus made on our behalf, number two, Jesus prayed that we will be with him to see his glory. And the third prayer request that Jesus prayed for us, number three, Jesus prayed that we will be filled with his love. In verses 25 and 26 of our verses, Jesus prayed, Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. And those last six words of Jesus' prayer right there, they are absolutely key to our walk with God. Jesus prayed that I myself, that's Jesus himself, may be in them. That's his followers. And that's us. Everything about us, everything about our lives as followers of Jesus is all about the indwelling of Jesus. The book of Colossians chapter 1 verse 27 says, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ with you. In other words, Jesus with you, that's comforting and reassuring, but Christ in you, Jesus in you, that's absolutely revolutionary. And the Apostle Paul, he prayed a similar prayer for all his fellow followers of Jesus. In the book of Ephesians chapter 3 verses 16 through 19, he said, I pray that God may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and firmly established in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, height and and depth of God's love and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Again, all true followers of Jesus are filled with God's Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus's great sacrifice of love. And that means that all of us who believe are filled with the fullness of God's love. And that's what creates unity among us as believers. And so how do we maintain that unity? I'm glad you asked because the answer, as always, is found in the Bible. It's in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, 
verse 2, the way we maintain Christian unity is by looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So don't look at some politician or some Hollywood or sports elitist out there for the answers. Hey, don't look at me either or any other man or woman for that matter when it comes to someone being a role model for unity. Always, always look to Jesus. Now, if you had a hundred pianos and you lined them all up and you decided you were going to try to tune all those pianos together to each other, you'd be making one big mistake because you can't tune a piano to the piano next to it. If you had those 100 pianos and you decided you were going to tune piano two to piano one and then tune piano three to piano two, by the time you got to piano 100, well, Piano 100 and Piano 1 and all the pianos in between, they would be totally out of tune. And that's why piano tuners, when they tune pianos, they use something called a tuning fork. If a piano tuner tunes 100 pianos, each of 100 pianos to that tuning fork, well, when he's all done, all of those pianos, they're going to be right in sync. They're going to be in perfect tune with each other. And that's absolutely a parable in and of itself because Jesus is our tuning fork. And it's the same thing for all of us. We shouldn't be trying to tune our lives to the lives of other people out there. We shouldn't even be trying to tune our lives to each other. Instead, each of us, all of us, we should tune our hearts to Jesus's heart. And then all of our lives are going to be in perfect pitch with each other. Back to that tuning fork. Another thing about a tuning fork, if you pick up a tuning fork that makes an A note and you hit it on the heel of your hand, it's going to make an A note. It was an A note yesterday. It's an A note today. It's going to be an A note tomorrow. And it's going to be an A note a thousand years from now. Listen, there are so many things that are false in this life. And even what's real is only temporary. But Hebrews 13, 8 tells us Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Right now, there are millions of people out there in this world who are lost without Jesus. And as Jesus is as followers, we need to be out there reaching them with the love of God. We need to come out from the church walls and be who God called us to be, the church, the called out people of God. I pray that we will no longer be frozen together by formalism or wired together by organizational ties or roped together by religion. Instead, I pray that we are going to be a body of one melted together by God's love found only in Jesus, who is the Christ. Where do you stand today? Until the next time you and I meet here on The Way the Word Ministries television ministry, may God bless you, may God keep you, and may God grant each and every one of you the desires of your heart, all in Jesus' mighty name. Until then, I'll see you later, everybody.